able to enjoy recreationally. And then finally, we have some um, other units as well that um, don't quite fit into those other categories, um, such as um, we have national monuments, which really kind of cover the entire gamut of what we're managing at the National Park Service, from national uh, natural areas to um, natural and historic resources. And then we have some um, other interesting type of types of parks, um, such as what we find in DC. So what we're really looking at at the National Park Service is that we're managing not only a, a wide swath of ecosystems, but also um, different management units that are uh, managed very differently from one another. Je Jennifer, could I just interrupt for a second? I just wanted to mention that I am recording this event, if that's okay, so that people that haven't been able to join uh, can watch it at a later date. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. All right, so what we are here today to talk about is actually the invasive animals problem at these national park units. So first I'd like to start with a definition of invasive species because it's um, not defined the same way by all groups, but within the federal government we actually do have a specific definition that we use and it's that an invasive species is a non-native species that is causing harm to the environment, economy, or human, animal, or plant health. So it's not just about where the species is from, but it's also about the harm that it is causing. So to get a little more specific, I'm gonna talk about our invasive animals program today. And this was actually only established back in 2018. Um, and it was done so in order to address gaps that were identified in two National Park Service reports. Um, it's also important that I point out when I talk about invasive animals today um, that I'm only including terrestrial and um, some semi-aquatic vertebrates and invertebrates. We actually have um, separate aquatic invasive species programs within the National Park Service that are managed by different people. Um, so the size of the issue at the National Park Service is very widespread. Um, over half of all the park units are reporting invasive animals, and this number is actually probably quite a bit higher. It's just that not all of our national park units have natural resource specialists on staff that can identify the issue. We've also identified over 175 species at the parks, which may seem small when you compare it to invasive plants, but when you consider that um, there are many more plant species that we're dealing with at the parks, um, just overall, this is actually a very large number. Um, also in 2021, which is the most recent year that we have um, complete data for, um, 68 parks have actually reported invasive animals being adjacent to their park unit. So this isn't just a problem that's already occurring in the parks, but we also have some issues that we're dealing with that are really knocking at the door of the parks as well. The most reported species in our parks include free ranging cats. I'm sure a lot of other folks out there are aware of this issue um, within their own countries. And um, of course, many people see these as just being their pets. However, they are very damaging to the environment and also cause public um, health and safety issues as well. Emerald ash borers have been really devastating to our forest here in the United States. And in fact, I actually just had to have a very large ash tree removed from my own front yard because of emerald ash borer this summer. Um, feral swine, even though they've been here in the United States for over 400 years, um, have actually really started to cause problems within the last several decades. And um, they not only damage the environment, but also agricultural areas and can spread diseases to both people and to livestock as well. So they have become a really major issue here in the United States and um, are found in a number of different parks. Imported red fire ants have caused um, issues with sea turtles um, when they're trying to nest out on beaches in different national parks. And again, are also a public human health and safety um, issue. And then house mouse, it's of course widespread around the globe. Um, and can be found in so many different types of our national parks, not just our natural resource parks, um, but causes a lot of issues um, with um, not only the environment, but again, once, once again, that human um, health issue as well. So what exactly are we doing about this at the National Park Service? <clears throat> well, first I'd like to discuss just a few of the laws and authorities that we actually have that allow us to manage invasive species. 
Um, I think the last time I counted, there were about 42 different laws and authorities out there that touch on this issue. I'm just going to cover a few of the major ones right now. So um, I did already mention our mission, um, which is part of our Organic Act of 1916, and it is to protect our um, natural and cultural resources. And we interpret this as also meaning that we need to be able to protect them from invasive species. We also have that executive order that has given us our definition of invasive species that requires us to actually manage invasive species, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so long as it is feasible for us to do so. And this allows us to use a variety of tools, including prevention, early detection, rapid response, control methods, research, and education as well. So it gives us this broad range of tools to be able to manage invasive species. And then we also have our National Park Service management policies. Um, here, the policies use the term exotic species, which we don't really use anymore. Um, we use invasive species now instead of this term. Um, however, we do use these terms interchangeably, and this policy does require us, well, it, it ensures that we do not allow an invasive species to displace a native species. It requires us to undertake any management possible in order to protect the resources of the National Park Service. And then finally, the Department of the Interior, which is the department under which we serve, also has an invasive species strategic plan that has priorities um, for us to work on, such as prevention, early detection, rapid response, control and eradication, and then also um, working with our partners, collaborating with other people to do landscape uh, on a scale level uh, work, and then also improving our, um, our data on invasive species so that way we have the, the clearest picture of what is actually occurring. So in order to undertake management at the parks, the most important thing to do first is to actually plan well. And um, at the park level, <clears throat> there are a number of different tools that they use for planning. One of these is their general management plans, and these um, are actually uh, developed in order to, um, to help meet a broad uh, range of management goals that a national park would need to um, achieve in order to protect their resources. Generally, these plans only uh, mention invasive species in very broad terms. Um, only occasionally will they mention specific species and usually don't uh, provide a lot of detail on how these invasive species would be managed. However, there are also resource stewardship strategies that are being developed at the parks. And these are long range planning tools. And they identify those resource conditions that each park wants to be able to achieve and identify specific actions to take in order to achieve those resource conditions. So many of the actions within these resource stewardship strategies are much more specific as to what the park will undertake in order to manage an invasive species. And it may mention either invasive species as a whole, or else sometimes we'll even mention specific invasive species that, that they want to manage. And then finally, some of the parks also have species specific management plans. And this usually occurs if a park has a really um, has a particular issue with a certain species or a group of species. Um, these we commonly see with um, species such as um, invasive ungulates, which tend to um, cause a lot of problems at the parks, uh, free-ranging cats, and um, also Indian mongoose can um, sometimes be another species that's included. Um, so these plans actually outline those specific actions that we'll be taking against that single species or that group of species and tend to be much more detailed than these other two options here. We also um, do a lot of work at the national level to help the parks with their invasive species management planning. So for instance, we have developed a pest and invasive species website that provides that information that parks can then use to help them better plan their invasive species management projects. And with that, we've developed management strategies for individual species. Um, and these management strategies include information on uh, things such as how to identify the species, um, the biology of the species, and then the types of tools that then may be used in order to manage the species. And um, these have been really helpful in um, telling parks exactly what they can do to manage species. And we've had a lot of uh, wonderful people working on these management strategies with us. Um, then there's also a um, <clears throat> project kit that we have developed 
And this is a tool that walks parks step by step through um, everything that they need to do in order to develop a um, good uh, management project. And this tool, this kit also helps to enforce the use of um, integrated pest management. So um, we're ensuring that that parks aren't just, you know, picking the, the quickest tool that they can think of in order to manage a species, which unfortunately oftentimes can be the use of chemicals. But they're also thinking about other tools that may actually be better um, for managing species. And this just helps to ensure better success of the parks. We are also working on spatial models um, with the US Geological Survey. So one of those is the Inhabit Toolkit, which is a habitat prediction model that not only tells parks which species um, can occur within their boundaries, but also lets them know how far away those species are from their boundaries. <coughs> Excuse me. At this point, this tool only has invasive plants um, that they are modeling, but we are working with them in order to add invasive animals models as well. And then we're also working with them on a management prioritization tool which identifies those habitats which are at most risk for being invaded by any invasive species in the future, and also takes into consideration what sensitive resources are at each site. So that way we're really managing those sites that we want to make sure we, we do protect. And then finally, our climate change program has developed this thing called the RAD framework. And what it does is it tells parks um, it, it helps them to decide whether or not they're going to resist, adapt, or direct certain aspects of change that are occurring due to climate. Um, this is a tool that we see great opportunity for using in managing invasive species as well. And we haven't applied it yet, but we are starting to work on that as well. So when you actually finally do start undertaking management, what we prefer to see is parks using prevention in order to manage um, their invasive species. Because if you catch a species early in the invasion process, it is much cheaper and much more likely to be successful. So we really do try to push for prevention at the national parks. In order to do that, we've been developing certain education and outreach products. And we're doing this by partnering with the North American Invasive Species Management Association, Wildlife Forever, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we're developing outreach products that are actually standardized, so that way they're being used at multiple protected areas throughout the country. And we're hoping that this helps to internalize that message better and really is what makes the, the change in the human behavior that we need to see. Um, and then we also work with this group in order to develop certifications and strategies so that we, we are preventing the introduction of new species. So when prevention fails, then we need to go to early detection and rapid response, which is the next step of that invasion process. Um, <clears throat> at the national level, we have collaborated to develop a white paper that is um, that helps us to identify what each agency's role in um, EDRR. So this will make it a lot easier for parks to understand what they are allowed to undertake when they are doing um, rapid responses and um, then also what they're expected to do when they are undertaking this type of management. Um, we've also been involved with the implementation of the National EDRR Framework, which is being developed in order to um, help uh, make EDRR a lot easier um, for us to do throughout the United States. And this includes um, trying to improve eDNA technologies, improve our predictive modeling, um, and then also looking into how we can get more boots on the ground to actually do the rapid response work. So currently um, at the National Park Service, we've been partnering with the USGS to work on some of those spatial models that I had mentioned earlier. And then finally, the parks are the ones who are actually implementing EDRR plans at this moment. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of resources to do that at this point, but that is also something that we are currently working on. So a good example of an EDR project is the work um, that the Everglades has done with the Argentine black and white tegu. Um, they found some breeding populations in the area in 2008, and there have even been a few tegus that have made it into the park. So, um, but they haven't really established there. So the park has been working with the University of Florida interns in order to trap um, tegus that are along the park boundary. And so far they've trapped about 2,800 tegus since 2019. 
However, the species still has not become established in the park yet. Um, finally, when prevention and EDRR do not work, then we all we can really do is try to control and, if at all possible, eradicate the species. Again, this is going to be much more expensive um, than the other two options and is far less likely to be successful. However, we can still sometimes get some control of the species. Um, again, this is something that is implemented at the park level. Um, unfortunately, for invasive animals, control technologies can be limited for many of the species. Um, things tend to be better when we're dealing with invasive insects. However, when we start looking at things like reptiles and mammals, there just really aren't as many technologies out there for successfully managing those species. Um, however, we do collaborate with partners in order to accomplish some landscape level control and eradication. And a good example of a collaboration right now is the Hawaiian Forest Birds work um, that we've been working on at Haleakala National Park. There are currently four species of Hawaiian forest birds that are at Im imminent risk of extinction. Um, and this is partially due to climate change, but it's also um, due to avian malaria, which is a vector that we can really control. Um, the, an invasive mosquito is what is spreading the avian malaria. And so um, we've been partnering with um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Geological Survey, um, the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations, and then our department's um, Office of um, uh, Budget and Policy. And um, we've developed a strategy for actually managing um, the invasive mosquito and also helping to protect uh, forest birds at, um, across the Hawaiian Islands. Um, however, Haleakala National Park will be the first site that will receive um, um, a control of invasive mosquitoes through an insect incompatibility technique. Um, we've also been working with, this, with state agencies, non-governmental organizations, and universities as well to make sure that we are working once again at a landscape level to manage um, this issue. And an example of success of um, managing an invasive species at a park is feral swine management at Cumberland Island National Seashore. So it was uh, noticed a number of years ago that sea turtle nests were being predated by feral swine and that their numbers were dropping precipitously. So the park ended up forming an interagency agreement with USDA's wildlife services in order to remove uh, feral swine and to protect nests. And I also know that the biologist at Cumberland Island National Seashore did quite a bit of management on his own as well. Um, but um, after several years of doing this management, the feral swine population is so low now that it's really not causing a problem anymore. And the sea turtle nests um, are actually on the rebound and they actually had a um, banner year for, for nests a couple of years ago. So there are a number of challenges that we're dealing with at the National Park Service as relates to invasive animals. For one thing, um, my program is still very new and we don't have a lot of capacity um, at this point, but um, I have been working on that quite a bit and hopefully um, things will continue to improve in the future. Um, also, the National Park System is very large, it's very widespread and diverse, so it can be really difficult to develop a program um, that covers so many different ecosystems and so many different management types. Um, so management efforts do vary quite a bit across the National Park Service, and that's, I mean, that's just required. But it's also um, required because invasive animals are so um, taxonomically uh, different from one another. So when you're working with things from insects to mammals to reptiles, you're looking at a lot of different types of expertise that is required to do this type of management. And then finally, the spread of invasive species is actually regulated by other agencies and not by the National Park Service. So in order to kind of uh, deal with some of these issues, we've um, formed a lot of collaborations and partnerships, and these do allow us to work across a landscape scale because let's face it, invasive animals do not care about boundaries. Um, it's also helped us to increase our capacity and resources, especially as relates to just the lack of expertise at different parks. Um, and then it's also allowed us to standardize tools and products that we're using. So that's been really important, especially with prevention materials. And then finally, it also gives us a voice at the table. So even though we don't manage things like the pathways of spread, we're actually able to work with other agencies that do 
and we can help to ensure that they're developing policies that are helping the National Park Service as well as many other um, organizations. So a couple of partnerships that I work with include our prevention memorandum of understanding that I had mentioned before. And this is the group that we're working with in order to develop these standardized uh, messages that um, help teach people uh, to not spread invasive species around the country. And then I also work with an island restoration memorandum of understanding, which includes not only other government agencies, but also um, non-governmental organizations. And we work together in order to identify and implement projects that um, benefit all of us and helps us to spread out our expertise once again um, to different um, islands to do this work. And um, we're also working on raising visibility of island invasive species issues, which seems, seems to be gaining a lot more traction lately. And then finally, we also have what we call our invasive species quintfecta. Um, it's actually a group of us at the National Park Service who all work on invasive species and pest issues. And um, we noticed a while ago that we a lot of our work overlaps and that just makes a lot more sense for us to work together and just kind of save each other some time. So we do develop invasive species guidance and policies together. We also create tools such as that invasive species website that I had mentioned before. And these help to provide information um, to the parks and assist them with invasive species management. And again, any time we have any areas of overlap, we just collaborate together just to make things a lot easier for us and make sure that we're using a lot of the same methods in order to manage invasive species. So what the future holds for us is that um, we're going to continue to work with and build partnerships so that way we can work across work on projects across those boundaries, um, increase capacity and resources. Um, increase visibility of invasive animal issues, um, even though uh, oftentimes these are more popular invasive species issues um, for, in the public eye. Um, it can be hard to gain traction on invasive animal issues within the government itself, just because it is such a difficult issue to deal with. Um, and invasive animals are so much more difficult to uh, manage than um, other species may be. Um, I'll also continue to work on collaborations that develop innovative tools and products and um, provide some input to those efforts that are outside the scope of the National Park Service, but that may actually affect us as well. Um, additionally, we will continue to prioritize prevention and early detection and rapid response. And um, I will keep working to provide information and tools that will help parks to more efficiently um, do the work that they need to do in order to manage invasive animals. So that is actually all I have um, for today, and I'll be ha happy to answer questions once we get to the Q&A portion. Okay, thank you, Jen. That was very interesting. You certainly really do have a tough job and um, all that you have to do. So our next speaker is Sarah Funk from the non-native fish. Um, well, she's from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So we'll get a perspective of uh, how a state deals with this issue. She is she manages a team of biologists that strive to minimize the adverse impact of non-native species in Florida through prevention, rapid response, control programs for established species, research support, and public outreach and engagement. Sarah received her master's degree in environmental science from from Florida Gulf Coast University and a bachelor's degree in biology from Millersville University and is an alumnus of University of Florida's Natural Resource Leadership Institute. She has extensive experience with invasive species management, herpetology and stakeholder engagement. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, David. Sure. Right. Let's screen sharing. Great. Okay. All right, how does that look, David? It looks good, thanks. Okay. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. As David mentioned, my name is Sarah Funk and I'm the Non-Native Fish and Wildlife Program Coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Our agency's mission is primarily to manage natural resources 
both native and invasive for the long term uh, well being of those species and for the benefit of our citizens. So I really, again, lead a team of biologists that work specifically with non native and invasive fish and wildlife. In Florida, it is a statewide program that I oversee, so I oversee all operations and projects pertaining to the management of these species and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. So in the state of Florida, we're in the southeast portion of the United States, and unfortunately our state is very susceptible to invasion. Our subtropical climate, multiple ports of entry, and a booming wildlife trade have actually contributed to successful establishment of several species. We've received well over 100,000 observations of non-native fish and wildlife in the state of Florida, and that represents about 550 species. But that doesn't mean, of course, that they're all established. That doesn't certainly mean that they're all invasive. But we believe that approximately 139 of those species are established and reproducing in the state. And that doesn't include lionfish. So lionfish, of course, are another invasive species in our marine waters. And we've removed almost a million lionfish since 2011. And you can see from these graphics here, the first observation of lionfish was in 1985. And since that time, they have spread dramatically throughout not just the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic coast of Florida, but throughout the Caribbean and even northwards in the Atlantic as well. So this is another species of um, invasive wildlife or fish rather that we take uh, as a high priority in the state of Florida. So clearly we have some significant issues with this problem in the state. So how do these things get here? Through, of course, unintentional and unintentional releases, uh, unintentional hitchhiking can occur and does occur, especially through cargo shipments. Um, we see things like the mongoose pictured here occasionally show up at our ports in Florida. Uh, this particular mongoose was found at Port Everglades on a sugar shipment as a hitchhiker and was successfully removed. Of course, we also have intentional importation. Again, I mentioned there's a booming live animal trade in Florida, and a lot of these species enter the United States through the port of Miami or through the Miami airport. So of course, the most common pathway of introduction in our state is either the escape or release of non-native animals. And again, that can be intentionally or unintentionally. So why do we care? Of course, there are impacts from these invasive species. Again, non-native species at large are not necessarily harmful, but if they do pose harm to our state's ecology, economy, or human health and safety, we consider them invasive. And this can come in a variety of ways through direct depredation of native wildlife, habitat alteration, competition for resources, or the introduction of novel disease and parasites and the transmission of those disease and parasites. And we've got a few examples highlighted here. Uh, the Argentine black and white tegu, which is in the top photo here. This is a photo from the uh, University of Florida where they documented a invasive tegu uh, consuming an alligator egg from an alligator nest. The bottom picture here shows an invasive Burmese python from Everglades National Park that consumed uh, prey as large as a white-tailed deer. They're also known to take other species, including birds and mammals. So these types of in, uh, species do pose significant adverse impact to our state's native wildlife. There's also economic impacts that can be of concern as well. State of Florida has a very significant invasive green iguana population in southern Florida. This is a species that doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily found in our natural areas, but more in the urban suburban sprawl that we see in South and Southeast Florida. And because of their burrowing behavior, they can really impart significant impacts to very important infrastructure that we have in the state, like water control features, seawalls, canals, canal banks. Once those burrows go into the soil, they can actually significantly degrade the integrity of those um, really important pieces of infrastructure. And of course, human, human health and safety is another um, concern of ours with invasive species. So here's a more specific um, hypothetical example of what some of those impacts could look like from one of our more high priority and high profile invasive species in the state, the Burmese python. This graphic shows a hypothetical diet necessary for a hatchling Burmese python to reach 
approximately 13 feet in length in the Everglades, which can take between five and seven years. So this is again just a graphic to help everyone visualize what kind of impact a single individual Burmese python can cause on our in, uh, native wildlife. So if we stick with pythons for just a minute, I also wanted to mention um, the hist a little bit of history about pythons because it is one of our highest profile species in the invasive species world in Florida. The first Burmese python was documented from near Everglades National Park in 1979. That's indicated by the red star in the map on the left. And since that time, the Burmese pythons have spread dramatically throughout our natural areas in South Florida. Each of the yellow dots on the map on the right showcase a confirmed observation or removal of a Burmese python, and this goes through 2020. So this particular species is now very well established in southern Florida, where this very dense cluster of yellow dots now occurs, essentially from Lake Okeechobee south into the Florida Keys. And your Lake Okeechobee is right here in the middle of the state. Keys are these island chains that go in the very southern end of the state. So what's interesting about the Burmese python is they're really primarily found in our natural areas. We've got a conglomeration of natural areas in southern Florida that includes Everglades National Park, Big Cypress National Preserve, several, excuse me, state parks, national wildlife refuges, and other state managed lands as well, all of which work together to um, combat this invasive species. So I want to talk next a little bit about the invasion curve. Jennifer kind of mentioned the different components of invasion biology, and I thought that was a great introduction to this. I love this graphic. What this showcases is that over time, as an area becomes more infested with an invasive species, control costs go up and the likelihood of eradication of that species becomes less and less likely. So like Jennifer had already mentioned, prevention is the key. We want to stay on the prevention side of the invasion curve as much as we can. Now, something like the Burmese python falls on the higher end of this particular curve and something more along the lines of asset based protection and long term management of the species because it is so well established. So in the case of the Burmese python, our efforts are geared primarily towards protecting sensitive areas, things like bird rookeries, critical wildlife areas, and protecting endangered and threatened species that are at risk due to the presence of the Burmese python. But certainly we have different examples of invasive species in the state of Florida that fall at different parts of this curve. Of course, again, our efforts primarily lie in prevention and eradication whenever we can make that feasible. But the reality is we do have several high priority invasive species that fall in that more long term management um, section of the curve. So my team really addresses each of these different components of the invasion curve, and I want to just walk through what some of these things look like for us. So on the prevention side of things, we actually are the state agency. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is the state agency with constitutional authority over regulating wildlife resources in the state of Florida, and that includes invasive species. So our team actually has a wing or a sector of our program that is geared towards rule development to address invasive species issues. We also do permitting for different um, uses of invasive species across the state, but we also look at prevention and a part of prevention is determining risk of a species. So we work very closely with partners and universities in particular, like the University of Florida, to conduct risk screening of potentially invasive or high risk non-native species. We looked at a variety, we look at a variety of biological factors when we think about screening for risk of a given species. You can see some examples listed here, things like reproductive potential, dispersal ability, are they a disease vector, um, and so on and so forth. But we also look at economic impacts, human health and safety impacts, climate matching, and other factors that could contribute to the potential risk that they could pose to the state. So mo more recently, we did con or conducted several risk screens of some high risk species and created these um, visual aids as part of our outreach for the public to explain why these species were considered a high risk. And so one example that I have here is for you to take a look at is a reticulated python. These encompass a big picture of why species risk came out the way it did. And we have these um, risk summary sheets available for anyone to see on our website. 
So we take a look at all these different components. We create these risk screen summaries, and then ultimately before we develop any kind of rules, we want to engage with our stakeholders within the state to get feedback on any potential proposed rules pertaining to invasive species. And these rules are covered in our chapter 68-5 in Florida Administrative Code. So we take all of that information, including stakeholder feedback, to the FWC's commissioners who ultimately determine how to regulate or not to regulate a species. Now within that rule chapter in the state of Florida, we have different regulatory classifications for non-native species. Uh, the first I'll go over is called conditional species. These are high risk non-native species that are not allowed for personal possession. So people cannot keep these animals as pets. Through the permitting process, people can use these animals and possess them for specific uses with at qualifying facilities, including commercial sales, exhibition, and research. These types of species have very strict biosecurity requirements in rural and facilities that possess these through the permit have to um, undergo annual inspections to ensure that there's no risk of escape of these species in uh, captivity. So a couple examples, there's quite a few aquatic species on our Florida's conditional species list, things like freshwater stingrays as an example are conditional. We also have one unique exception in this rule, the red-eared slider that is considered conditional, but can actually be kept as a pet through a permit. And that is the only species that's handled that way. The next more restrictive regulatory classification in the state of Florida is what we call the prohibited species. Again, these animals cannot be kept for personal possession. In other words, it cannot be kept as pets. And it takes it a step further from conditional and eliminates the use of these species for commercial sales. So through the permitting process, prohibited species can be kept and used by qualifying facilities for exhibition and research. And there are some recent exceptions built into this rule, but that's a little bit too um, in the weeds for, for this group. If you guys have questions, be happy to answer that though. Again, these species do require strict biosecurity measure, measurements to prevent escape of the animals when they're kept in captivity and annual inspections are conducted by law enforcement to ensure facilities are in compliance with those requirements. Another really exciting program that our team works on is the Exotic Pet Amnesty Program. This is very preventative in nature as well. This is something that's actually codified in our rule chapter and it offers amnesty. It allows the state to offer amnesty for people who can no longer keep their non-native species that are being kept as pets. It doesn't matter if those animals are being kept legally or illegally. There are no questions asked, there are no penalties, and there are no costs to participate in this program. So this is really a legal alternative for pet owners that prevents them from hopefully releasing their animals into the wild. And since this program was created several years ago, we've had over 6,700 animals requested to be surrendered and rehomed through the exotic pet amnesty program. We now have year-round operations for this program, which is great. We have the 888-I've-got-one hotline and the pet amnesty email address where people can request to surrender or request to become an adopter through this program. We actually have over 800 qualified adopters for various taxa right now, and so we reach out to those adopters when we get a request for an animal to be surrendered, and we work with those adopters and those surrendering pet owners to try to facilitate rehoming for those animals. We've recently expanded this program as well, so now we have many, many out-of-state adopters in our system as well, and that's been really, really helpful because we had a recent rule change that added green iguanas and tegus to the state's prohibited list. And once that happened, we had some difficulty in placing those animals when they were surrendered through the exotic pet amnesty program with in-state adopters. So we decided we need to think bigger. We need to think outside the box. We identified and recruited several out-of-state adopters, and now we work with them regularly to rehome those species when they come to us. So overall, this is a really successful program. We really love it, and we're really proud of the success that we have with this one. Now I mentioned the I've got one hotline, the 888 I've got one hotline. This is a hotline that is operated by um, one of my staff every day, Monday through Friday. And not only does it take calls about 
pet amnesty requests, but it's also a public reporting tool that exists in the state of Florida so that members of the public can report any observations of non-native and invasive wildlife to the state in hopes that we can coordinate rapid response to remove that animal from the environment. So if we think back to the invasion curve, we're now moving up the curve slightly into that eradication rapid response segment. So this is another way that we get reports is also through the I've got one.org website, which is the same as EdMaps, and also through the I've got one smartphone app. When people report their observations of a species, we look for three big things to be able to determine whether or not we can actually coordinate a successful response. We're looking for high quality, quality photographs so that we can confirm identification of a species. We're looking for specific location or GPS points for where that species was seen and the date when it was seen. Ideally, in an observation report, someone has seen that animal recently or is actually looking at it real time when they contact us. So as I'm sure you all know, the sooner we can move on these rapid response efforts, the more likely they are to be successful. If we receive a blurry image or an image that's really far away, we don't have great location data, or the animal was seen three weeks before the report came to us, there's not a lot that we can do with that particular situation. So when we get these calls uh, for early detection and rapid response or EDRR, uh, we get them again primarily through the website or the hotline. And our operators, our people who are reviewing these reports, ask themselves a couple questions. Is this report credible and is it verified? If it's not verified, then maybe we don't coordinate a response. Second question here is, is it a high priority species for removal? That's a really important question too, because it all leads into our third question of, do we have capacity to respond? Not every species that we receive a report about is considered a high priority for the state. And that's primarily because we just do not have the bandwidth to respond to every single report of every single species that we have. I have approximately 15 to 20 staff primarily in South Florida, where a lot of the primary issues are occurring. But if we get a report in a different part of the state, we have to reach out to our partners, volunteers, contractors, law enforcement, and many other potential options um, to actually be able to coordinate a successful rapid response. So we have to say, yes, it's a verified or credible report. Yes, it's a high priority for us to use resources to respond to. And yes, we actually have the capacity to respond. So if that happens, we can move forward with our response efforts and we use a variety of tools and techniques to catch a variety of different taxa, everything from reptiles and birds to mammals and fish, just depends on the situation. Um, pictured here, we have uh, some of our staff working with local law enforcement to remove a spectacled caiman, which is an invasive species in the state of Florida. And on the bottom picture, we have one of our staff that had removed an Asian water monitor from an area. So I wanted to also emphasize that early detection rapid response not only requires resources, but it requires a lot of time and dedication from whomever the responders are. This particular example is a video I want to show you, and hopefully it decides to work. Hopefully y'all can see that. This Asian water monitor was reported through, I believe it was our hotline several years ago, and it took several days and persistence until we were able to successfully capture this. But you can see someone has to be really motivated and dedicated to crawl into that culvert where the water monitor was eventually found after three days of searching and hand catch it. So you can see he's really excited how successful it was, but this was a gravid female Asian water monitor. So these efforts are crucial to preventing a new establishment of a new species or possibly an established species in a new location. So this was a very successful EDRR that we had. Now, as we continue to think about shifting up the invasion curve and think more about our long-term control and management strategies, we think primarily about species that are well-established in the state, something like the Burmese python, for example. And so we have, with our partners, quite a few different python control and management programs and projects that we have underway to address this high-priority species. One in particular that's been very successful are our contracted removal programs. So both FWC and our sister agency, the South Florida Water Management District, hire contractors and compensate those contractors 
for their survey efforts and for pythons removed. So you can see here that the payment for an actual python removed starts at $50 for a python up to four feet, and for every additional foot after that, you get an additional $25 added onto your payment. So they get not just an hourly rate, but also payment per essentially foot of python. So if you find a large python and have been surveying for 10 hours, that's a pretty decent paycheck. Um, what's pictured on the right here are two of our uh, FWC and district contractors working together to remove the longest documented python in the state of Florida. This python was a large female at 18 feet 9 inches. And we really believe that every python removed from the environment is a success for native wildlife. But we can't do this program alone. We work closely with National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, DEP, county governments, and many others to ensure access for contractors so that they can actually go to some of our public lands and find these pythons to remove them for payment. And we also coordinate our efforts for early detection rapid response using these contractors as well. So if we look at the success of the contractor program over time, what you'll see on this graphic is that since the year 2000, we've been documenting Python removals, successful removals in the state. So the blue on this graphic shows all non-contractor efforts of Python removal over time. The green bars that start in 2017 show contractor removals of Pythons since that program inception in 2017. And you can see the dramatic increase in the number of pythons removed as a result of starting these programs. We've actually removed, it's actually over 17,000 pythons statewide since the year 2000, and over 10,000 of those pythons removed are specifically from these contracted removal efforts. So contractors are just one of many things that we use to address pythons and other species, but of, of course interagency coordination and community coordination is a huge component of what we do. We cannot do any of the work that we do at FWC without support from our partners and the public. Um, Tegus are another great example of where we have this community coordination. There is an established population of Argentine black and white tegus in several places in Florida. Miami-Dade County in particular though, has been well established for quite some time. We work just outside of Everglades National Park, and we work closely with the National Park Service, University of Florida, USGS, the district, and even other entities like Florida Power and Light to coordinate our annual trapping efforts to catch and remove as many tegus from those natural lands as we possibly can. The FWC now has contractors running trap lines in this area as well, so that's just another effort that's added to the mix. And we also do trap loans with landowners that are um, seeing tegus in Florida City and Homestead, which is just outside of this established range, just on the edge. So all those combined efforts really result in a successful removal of tegus every year. However, they are still well established, so we have to continue to put forth a lot of effort, time, and talent into these um, annual removal efforts. Another thing that FWC does in coordination with um, several partners is Nile Monitor Canal surveys. We also have an established population of Nile Monitors in Palm Beach County, which is just north of Miami as the crow flies. So what we do is these are semi-aquatic species from Africa, well-established on these canal banks. So we actually take boats up and down the canal systems where we know they exist we search for them visually, and if we see one and we have a clear and safe shot, we will remove that animal immediately with shotgun. Um, there are still a few Nile monitors out in these areas, so we still conduct these canal surveys several times a month, but they are very, very difficult to see, and we are at the point where we believe we've contained this species at some level, but it's, it's still very well established and you just never know. So it's another really important um, component of what we do. Awareness and outreach is another uh, serious component of what we do as well. One example of that is our Florida Python Challenge event that we host annually. This is all about awareness of invasive species issues and getting the public engaged in what we do and supportive of what we do. This past year in June, our Governor DeSantis announced that registration was open. The competition ran this year from August 5th through 14th, and we had almost 1,000 people register from 32 states, Canada, 
and I had a competitor from Latvia this year. We have both professional and novice categories and people can compete to remove the most and the longest pythons from participating public lands. Uh, we work closely with the Fish and Wildlife Foundation and other sponsors to support these efforts. And we've actually developed its own website, flpythonchallenge.org, so that people can register, get all the training that they need, and see different information about surveying for pythons in the Everglades. So we finished up this year, but I am sworn to secrecy on who the winners are. We're going to announce that information at the end of this month at our upcoming commission meeting. So stay tuned for that. And another thing that's really important um, regarding public engagement and community engagement in non-native species uh, efforts is uh, through this executive order 20-17. This is something that our executive director of FWC signed back in the year 2017. And what it does is it authorizes lethal take of invasive reptiles on 25 commission managed properties year round. And these properties are all centered in the southern part of our state. But what it does is it removes any kind of regulatory barriers from members of the public helping the state remove these invasive animals. So there are no permits or hunting licenses required. There are no bag limits and there are no reporting requirements for members of the public who are functioning under this executive order. There are some additional stipulations, of course. Anytime anyone removes an invasive animal, it always has to be done legally and humanely. You still need to follow all the other area regulations on site and ultimately, you come across one of these animals, you kill it on site and you can take it home and do with it what you will. Uh, we also emphasize on private lands that lethal take of invasive reptiles is authorized at any time as long as you have landowner permission. Again, we just want to remove um, any kind of regulatory barriers that are realistic or even just perceived so that people understand that they can be a part of the solution for the state of Florida. So I just want to wrap up now with some additional resources and information where you can find it if you're curious. MyFWC.com slash wildlife habitat slash non-natives is our non-native fish and wildlife homepage. There's a lot of really helpful information there. Everything from information on our rules and regulations, permits, species profiles, and other special projects to training. Also, our reporting information can be found online, I've got one.org, smartphone app by the same name, and 888 I've got one. Links to all of that is also available on the myfwc.com website. And of course, we have other links for members of the public who are interested how to become a contractor, for example, um, how to and where can I remove pythons and other invasive species, and of course, the flpythonchallenge.org website. So that's all I have for you guys today. It's a lot to absorb. I totally recognize that there's unfortunately so much going on in the state of Florida. I use pythons a lot as kind of the poster child, if you will, for invasive species issues in our state, but it's certainly not the only animal that we have to combat in the state. So with that, I will say thank you and I'll take any questions. OK, thank you, Sarah. That was very interesting. You certainly have your hands full. <laughs> that uh, with Florida. I know they have uh, so many issues. OK, please put your uh, questions in the chat and I'll recognize you and you can ask the question or. Um, let's see. Raise your hand and I'll recognize you or put your question in the chat. Thanks. Well, I'll get things started. So Sarah, I have a question. So you said some of the species you when they get trapped you allow people from other states to adopt them do, do those people that ad adopt the animals get training so that they don't at some later date release the animal into the wild so that the new animal becomes that uh, that state's problem a new problem for the yeah, state that's a great question so the pet am the exotic pet amnesty program that i referenced um, in that particular part of the presentation is specifically for people who want to surrender their unwanted pets. So we do not use that program to rehome wild caught animals. So you can't just go out to your yard, catch a wild green iguana and turn it into the pet amnesty program. We really want to reserve our adopters for legitimate pets. So all that being said, um, yes, when we work with out of state adopters, we actually first contact 
the state regulatory agency to ensure that they're okay with us reaching out to adopters in their state and explain how the program works and that kind of thing. We've been we've had nothing but um, support as far as I know from every state we've reached out to and we're trying to target um, animal rescues, nature centers, AZA accredited facilities, things like that so that we have um, a higher likelihood of finding a forever home for for these unwanted pets that have been surrendered. That's the ideal scenario. And so we we continue to try to spread that message. Don't let it loose, regardless of whether or not you are in Florida. <laughs> we absolutely don't want these getting out anywhere else either. Sure, that's great. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, I see a hand raised. Oh, Terry Hogan, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a question for both Sarah and Jen. Uh, I uh, I think it may be easier to get the public behind removal of reptiles than furry, you know, other furry animals. Um, and I'm just curious about what strategies you you use to you know, help persuade the the public that. Um, for example, cats, Jen, are very problematic and um, and get and really get uh, stakeholder support for removal of those species. Um, yeah, so one of the strategies um, we actually have um, developed a um, free ranging cat uh, engagement toolkit um, in the National Park Service to provide us with uh, some recommendations for how best to engage the public when we are managing cats. And I think really the most important thing is trying to find those areas of agreement that we have, which is even when it comes to cat welfare groups, um, many of them don't want to see cats suffer. So um, you know, they're, they're also against people abandoning cats in natural areas because it's not good for the cats either. Um, so trying to find those areas of agreement, even though they don't like the management tools that we use, um, sometimes we can find ways that we can um, find different management tools that um, will be acceptable to everyone. Um, unfortunately, it's not always the case, and we really don't have a silver bullet for trying to find um, the best ways to engage um, certain segments of the public when it does come to these warm, fuzzy creatures. I think um, horses are probably another issue too that we um, have a lot of issues with in the National Park Service or burrows. So, um, you know, if we ever do find that strategy, oh man, that, that would be great, but we are currently still working on it. And right now just trying to engage with those groups as much as possible. Yeah, I would echo. I would echo what Jennifer said. It's it's a challenging problem, absolutely, Terry. And it's um, something that our agency FWC has addressed up front for feral cats in particular. And if you don't mind, David, I'm just going to do a quick screen share again because I knew this question was going to come up. And so I already have the website pulled up where FWC has our policy on feral cats up front and center on our public website. So I just want to share that with you all, real quick. Just so you can kind of whoops see what it looks like. So if anyone's interested in this, um, this this is again on our public facing website for FWC, and it states what our policy is regarding uh, wildlife in general and how that pertains to feral cats. So this in particular is um, I, I think fairly clear. So the public has at least a clear expectation of what we will or will not do. Things like we will not initiate a campaign to eradicate outdoor cats will not act against homeowners for letting their cats outdoors, although we recommend against it, so on and so forth. So this is, um, I think, very useful for a starting point for something as potentially contentious as managing feral cats at a statewide level. I also mentioned that in the state of Florida, we have invasive monkeys, for example, which are extreme, that is a very, contentious issue. Rhesus macaques are well established in Silver Springs State Park um, and the surrounding areas, and there are human wildlife conflict issues sometimes that arise from the presence of those monkeys. 
We know that they have um, some diseases that are very serious, including herpes B, which when transmitted to humans can be fatal if not treated. And we know that they potentially impact um, our native birds as well. They, there's uh, research that documents that they've consumed nesting birds' um, eggs. So we know they're a problem, but we, just like Jennifer said, we don't have the perfect solution for dealing with a species like that because it is socially complex. So we are continuing to work on that with our partners. And right now, um, I can tell you there are two more law enforcement kind of centric uh, strategies that we our agency has taken in the more recent past and that we will continue to enforce. One is we actually developed a new rule a couple of years ago that prohibits the feeding of non-human primates in the state of Florida. And that was a direct result of trying to mitigate some of those human wildlife conflicts with those established monkey populations. So that can be enforced now because it is officially a rule in the state of Florida that you cannot feed monkeys essentially. And that helps. It's certainly not the cure-all, but it certainly helps. And with that, we'll we'll continue to look for those um, cr creative solutions, if you will, to to managing those species. But again, we don't have the silver bullet for a lot of them. Thank you, Sarah. Jonathan, did that answer um, take care of your question about parks working with park neighbors who allow allow their cats to free range? I think so, Dave. Yeah, I think that one of my pet peeves. Sorry unintended or you know i live next to a chesapeake and ohio national historical park here outside of dc which is a very long narrow park with presumably thousands of neighbors many of whom believe it's kind kinder to their pet cats to let them wander around their yards of course the yards the cats don't respect the boundary of the park and i've seen these cats in in park boundaries many times uh, you know hunting birds snakes small mammals etc so and that's just you know a very small stretch you can imagine that impact multiplied over 184 miles of park boundary and all thousands of homes. So again, I think the point is it's not just feral cats, but it's often, you know, cats with a home, pets with a home that get fed, but still go out every day and hunt. And I think we're just barely measured impact of that uh, in our in our natural areas. So that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. So Dorothy had a good uh, comment. Uh, has have you received support for organizations like PETA? The, the people for ethical treatment of animals. Do they support invasive species removal or do they fight you? Um, I am not aware of their broader invasive species um, policy statement, but I do know with free ranging cats that they do support removal and, and they do support huma humane euthanization. Um, for the reasons that I had mentioned earlier, that it is not healthy um, for domestic cats to be out in the wild. And um, and it's also not good for the wildlife and what the best solution in these cases is to euthanize because most of these cats are not adoptable. So so they, they are actually supportive of at least um, that. And I would imagine other invasive species as well. Well, thank you. OK, that's good. Are there any other questions or comments? I'll ask one again. Um, so when the invasive animals are removed, like pythons, what happens to the dead pythons? Do, do, <laughs> are the skins utilized in any fashion so that the state can make some money or is everything just burned? Yeah, good question. So generally speaking, um, as long as you have landowner permission, and there'll be some caveats, so hang tight to that. But as long as you have landowner permission, you do everything legally and humanely, most of the times uh, our contractors and members of the public can keep the Burmese python carcass. They Oftentimes they don't even have to report it to us. We prefer they do so we can continue to track where these animals have been found or seen. But yeah, people take them home. Um, they Oftentimes people will taxidermy the carcass make large skin displays. Some people make products out of the skins now. There's all kinds of artisans and, and crafters and creators that make all kinds of stuff now. So if you just search for Everglades, Florida Everglades, Burmese Python, 
stuff, <laughs> you'll find a gamut of, of products that are created using the skins. Um, in Everglades National Park and, and other National Park Service properties, that's not the case for the general public. They cannot remove Burmese pythons, but our contractors do have that special authorization to remove pythons from those public lands. And I believe that still they're allowed to keep those carcasses, even coming from the park. Okay, thank you. That was good. Uh, let's see, Marion uh, had a question. Is there the same policy for feral dogs? I think that's a good question. Uh, are, do are feral dogs a big problem in, in protected areas? Oh, I can't hear you, Jennifer. Oh, really? Oh, now I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not hearing um, as much of an issue on feral dogs. Um, they, they certainly do exist within the national parks, but what I hear from the parks mostly is feral cats. Um, and most management is directed at cats as opposed to dogs. Um, now, there have been other issues with dogs in parks that are mostly pet issues. So people with their dogs off leash, that does tend to be a bigger problem. Um, but that is not something that my program um, deals with. We do have social scientists that deal with those types of issues. OK, great. Thank you. Ah, my my boss has a question. Are chefs still featuring lionfish on their menus? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and I strongly encourage everybody to try it if you haven't. It is a very, very tasty fish. Uh, uh, some of our lionfish removal and awareness days, we've often that this is something that the FWC hosts in partnership with a lot of different cities and and tournaments, dive shops. All kinds of different folks come together for these uh, lionfish removal and awareness days. Oftentimes, chefs are featured at these outreach events to showcase that you can actually not just go out and catch and remove these animals from marine waters, but you can use them. So we we do try to promote consumptive use of invasive wildlife whenever we can. Um, we definitely push that even for Burmese pythons. Maybe not to eat Burmese pythons since they're so high in mercury, but certainly are supportive of people using the skins, like I mentioned earlier. So yeah, absolutely. The problem with the lionfish is it tends to be very expensive to harvest a large amount of lionfish from our reef systems. So the, and this is not my forte at all, economics is, is not my thing, but the supply demand ratio or whatever is, is not ideal. So if you do see lionfish on a menu, oftentimes it can be a little pricey. And sometimes you can see it in grocery stores like Whole Foods. Um, they'll actually sell whole lionfish that were removed from Florida waters, but it, it'll it be a little pricey. And that's okay. in part to compensate the divers who are putting in all the work to remove them one at a time, essentially. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Does anybody else have anything? Any other questions? Or comments? Well, um, could you guys put your email addresses in the chat just so in case anybody has any further questions they can follow up with you? Okay, Terry says excellent presentation. Okay, we have one more question um, from Sultan. He's got his hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, hello. Yeah, hello. hello. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I wonder, do we need to uh, identify the invasion stage before implementing a management program for the invasive species? I wasn't sure I got the whole part of that question. Can you repeat that? Do we need to identify them? Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Do we need to identify the invasion stage for our species before implementing a management plan for this? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that would absolutely be a requirement um, because it will depend upon what type of management you apply, whether you're in the prevention stage, the early detection rapid response stage or, stage, or else the containment stage where you're just doing control at that point. Yes, I fully agree. Um, it, it's really important to know what stage of the invasion curve your species is at or your population of a species is at before you make any management decisions. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too regarding management plans, the state of Florida actually now has two invasive species control and management plans that are taxa specific. Um, one is for lionfish and the other is for Burmese pythons. We just finished Florida's first Burmese python control plan last year and that was another joint effort with multiple partner agencies, organizations, and tribes, and even one NGO. And that was a multi-year um, process to finalize that control plan for that species that we know a lot about compared to a lot of other invasive species. So it, on the planning side of things, it is a lot of work, especially for those more well-established species that you don't have the silver bullet yet for, but it's totally worth it to organize your thoughts, come up with those unified strategies and goals and, and collaborate with your partner agencies. Okay, thank you. And Ahmed has a question as well. Go ahead, Ahmed. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to thank uh, National Park Service and I would like to thank the presenters. Uh, my name is Ahmed Al Malki. I'm from uh, Royal Commission for Al Ula from Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much. We appreciate your efforts and we wish you all the luck. Uh, I have one comment. Uh, you mentioned before about the the prevention of uh, the prevention of uh, invasive species. So I, I totally agree about that. Do you have, for example, a methodology or practical uh, ways to apply it? So, for example, I'm 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 afraid now in my uh, town T to to have Indian miner, for example. Uh, it's surrounding me, uh, south of of, of Al Ula, north of Al Ula. We 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 spotted Indian Indian miner. Uh, uh, th thanks to God, not yet uh, uh, arriving to Al, Al Ula. So I'm concerned about this. What what are the the practical uh, steps to to do to prevent having Indian miner in 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 our uh, county? Thank you so much, and I hope these efforts will continue. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, that's a that's a tricky one for sure. Anytime we talk about prevention is very tricky. So um, I can tell you what Florida does on our end uh, for prevention. We often look at special programs like the exotic pet amnesty program to be preventative in nature. Um, but we also have preventative regulation as well. So I don't know if that's an option for your country or not, but it, it would be something to consider potentially. Um, if there are species that your country deems as a high risk to your area, that could be something to consider. Um, creating that preventative regulation, put that in place before something establishes or is introduced so that it's that much easier to avoid those adverse impacts. That, that's been, um, I think, from my observations, one of the most effective control stat strategies is uh, preventative regulation. Okay, Ahmed, did that answer your question? Or did you have another one? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments for our two panelists? Okay, I don't see anything else. So uh, thank you for attending today. I, th I think both the presentations were very informative and very interesting. It's a topic that doesn't often get discussed out in public form. So thank you for Sarah and Jennifer for agreeing to talk to us today. And if there's no further questions, I guess we'll conclude today. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you everyone for having us. Bye-bye. Yeah.